All right. This morning I'm going to talk to you about a very important uh, development that's taking place in, in current events in terms of Bible prophecy. Uh, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We're going to have a little Bible study this morning. After all, it's Sabbath school hour. And uh, I want to thank the pastor and the elders for the invitation to share with you today. And uh, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to fellowship with the people of God in church on Sabbath morning. We're, my wife and I um, are here at the GYC conference in Phoenix. And so it was kind of convenient to come over here and share with you this morning. My wife, by the way, is sitting in the audience here. She is behind you on my right, your left. Put your hand up, sweetie. There she is. <laughs> Yes, she's a choir director uh, back at Heartland in Virginia, and she is also a voice teacher, and she is a educator of other things as well, and um, she and I came out here because uh, we, we have different reasons to be here, but we both come together, and so you get the both of us today. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 17, everybody there? All right. Verse 26, this is a very interesting verse. Paul is speaking to the Greeks. He's speaking to the Greeks on Mars Hill. This is his famous Mars Hill speech. Anybody who's read anything about Paul will know that this is the Mars Hill you know, speech. And he wasn't too successful, as you probably remember, in um, organizing a lot of souls to be won into the, the message of the Christian faith. And uh, consequently... Um, you know, it, it didn't really yield a lot. But at the same time, God has left his testimony in Scripture for us in these last days. And I'm amazed at how Scripture identifies and very specifically and clearly tells us exactly what to expect in the last days. And we're going to be talking about that a bit more at the 11 o'clock hour, especially. But I just wanted to say that at the beginning here because... If you don't have a love for the Bible, my friends, well, you need to develop it. <laughs> As you study the Bible, it's, it's a little bit like gardening. It grows on you. No pun intended. It grows on you, and, and after a while, you begin to love it. And as you see things here and things over here, and you tie them together, and the Holy Spirit drops some seeds, you begin to realize that the Bible is so integrated with our personal lives. It's not just integrated with itself. It teaches us how to act, how to walk, how to live, how to understand the things that are taking place in the world around us, especially, especially in these last days. And we need prophetic intelligence for these last days. And I hope that all of you are subscribers to our free monthly newsletter, or sorry, our free monthly CDs and our free daily briefings by email. And I know some of you are, as you've spoken to me, and I know some of you from previous engagements and opportunities. So anyway, I hope that you're all part of that. I'll be telling you more about that later as well. But let's read verse 26 to begin with. The Bible says, God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now, the sermon title this morning is The Bounds of Their Habitation. And I think it's important for us to understand that it was God who made the races. It was God who did it. But God did not make racism. And racism is a plague that not only plagues American society today, but it, it plagues every other society in the whole world. Believe it or not. We don't engage too much with that in other places unless you travel a lot. But bottom line is, it's everywhere. It's in the Philippines. It's in Asia, other parts of Asia. It is in Australia. It is in Europe. It is in America. It's in Latin America. It's everywhere you go. And it's different. The focus of racism is different from region to region, from nation to nation, or, or people group to people group. And racism is something that we need to perhaps understand because it has become a big political issue in the world that we're in today. Let me ask you a question. Do you think racism is going to go away before Jesus comes? No. 
Do you think racism is going to get smaller because of globalization? No. Do you think racism is going to be bene would, would be resolved by marches and defacing monuments and other things? No. no. It's only going to make it worse because that's exactly what it does. It creates tension between one side and the other and, and one provocative act generates another provocative act on the other side equal and opposite reaction that's just the nature of nature <laughs> uh, you know and and we have to expect that if some people do things that provoke one side the other side's going to feel it now, i don't know about you but i felt racism in my own against me in my own life And the thing about it is, it's never pleasant. But did Jesus tell us that we would live in a world free of racism? No. We as God's people need to understand this issue because if we come down to the end of time and we still have racism in our hearts, we'll lose our eternal salvation. And I'm going to point out something to you in a few minutes that I think will surprise you about how God intends to address the issue of racism in our lives. Right. Yeah. The thing about it is, there is going to come a time when racism will be eliminated. Amen. When is that? In the second, after the second coming. A actually, at the second coming is when it will end, and it will, of course, uh, progress right through to the new earth, and throughout all eternity, racism will be eliminated. However, in the meantime, we have to live with and deal with this issue in our own lives and in our own, uh, in our own commu uh, communities, our churches especially. Um, the problem that we see is that in the world we're living in today, um, the enemy has control of many, many different elements of society. And he does not like to let go of his, his people. And so when he can stir up racism in their hearts on either side, he causes people to sin against their fellow man and against God. That's what happens. And we as God's people have to realize that God is calling us to a much higher level. All right? Now let's have a look at, let's break this down. Verse 26 of Acts 17, if you're just coming in. Acts 17, verse 26. God hath made of one blood all nations of men. What is this one blood? What is this one blood? When was the last time that everybody on the planet was of one family? Huh? Adam and Eve. Well, not, yes, it was after Adam and Eve. Quite a while after, in fact. <laughs> when is the last time? No, not Noah. That's good. That's getting much closer. Tower of Babel. That was the last time. And these were all Noah's children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and all that. So it's all part of the family of Noah. So in, in essence, that's true. It is the family of Noah. And they all multiplied and grew. But actually, some of the family of Noah stayed faithful to the Lord. The sons of Shem and Japheth remained faithful. It was the sons of Ham that went and established the plains, uh, themselves on the plains of Shinar and uh, built the Tower of Babel and the city of Babel and three other big cities. And then in verse, um, well, we'll come to that in a minute. Anyway, so um, God, it says, God had made of one blood all nations of men. What did God do to make all nations of men? at the Tower of Babel. He started by confusing the languages. That's right. He started by confusing the languages. And when he confused the languages, he, um, he went and did something to those people that I think is very, very interesting. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But before we go any further, let's look at the Tower of Babel. Come over to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, a very interesting story, actually. And we read in chapter 10 that uh, Nimrod, who was the founder of Babel, uh, built four big cities. Babel, Erech, in verse 10 of chapter 10, it says, Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And then in verse 11, it says, Out of that land went forth one of Nimrod's 
uh, colleagues named Asher, or in other languages, Assyria. Ever heard of that place before? And builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Calah and, verse 12, Rezin between Nineveh and Calah. The same is a great city. So he built these big cities. And then it says in verse 19 that Canaan went out and built cities. It's it says, the border of the Canaanites, this is chapter 10, was from Sidon, which was a city named after his firstborn son. And um, as thou comest, it's like Moses taking us on a bus tour. <laughs> he says, as thou comest to uh, Gerar and Gaza, and then as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma, Zeboam and Lasha. There's eight more big cities. So you, got, you have these 16 big cities built by these uh, globalists. And these were the f this was the first attempt at globalization. This was the first time in history when human beings were trying to establish control over the whole world by a, 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 a monarch. In fact, the Patriarchs and Prophets tells us that Nimrod and his colleagues were working to develop a worldwide monarchy. And um, that was, so that would be the first attempt at, at globalization. God does not support globalization. This is the enemy that's doing this. And globalization is designed to control people and especially, ultimately, to control your what? Your thoughts, yes, especially your faith. Your faith. Because Revelation 13 tells us that the last attempt at globalization will be engaging the issue of worship. And that was actually the, the goal of Nimrod, was to get everybody worshiping this false religion. He was the father of all false religion. So, Revelation 13 tells us that, that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him. Now that's pretty global, isn't it? That's global worship. So ultimate destination of globalization is global worship. We need to understand that, that we get that right from the Bible. So you want to know where the globalists are headed today with globalization? They're headed straight into worship. They aren't talking about that right now. They aren't discussing it. They're not debating it, but they are planning it. That's where it's going to go. And Rome stands in the background waiting her opportunity to establish herself in, as the central principle of the global worship. Rome is a globalist organization, you see. Now, um, as we go along here, um, we see in chapter 11 that the whole world, the whole earth, verse 1, was of one language and one speech. He might as well have said one family, because that's what they were. And then it tells us how they built the Tower of Babel. Verse 4, they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad from thence, uh, sorry, uh, abroad on the face of the whole earth. So in other words, these Babel builders were very concerned about their safety, <laughs> weren't they? They thought if God was going to be so capricious as to bring another flood, we've got to be having a way of escape. So they built the tower so they could escape from that. But they also had other objectives as well. And the bottom line is that um, as they were there at the Tower of Babel, um, they were in rebellion to God's plan to scatter them abroad from the, 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 the ark and, and out beyond that to replenish the whole earth. God had told Noah replenish the whole earth which means to scatter not congregate in big cities and so they're concerned about scattering and they say we have, we're we're better off if there's if if we're in great numbers there's safety in numbers you know that's the that's a human idea that there's safety in numbers i can tell you that it is the big cities that are the targets of the enemy if you live in a big city you 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 risk a natural disaster or perhaps a, a man-made disaster such as a missile with a bomb on it. You've heard about that recently in the news, haven't you? Cities are the targets of the enemy. They're death traps. So congregating together in big cities isn't going to save you. No, in fact, God wants to protect you by moving you out of the city, ultimately, into the country where you can uh, have a home, where you can grow your own veggies, I almost said grow your own. <laughs> you know, out here in, in Arizona, do they grow their own? <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> I suppose maybe they do. Some people, anyway. Certainly nobody here today would be growing their own, meaning weed, you know. And I'm not meaning weeds. I'm meaning weed. You know the difference between weeds and weed? <laughs> okay. Anyway, bottom line is you grow your own vegetables. That way you're not dependent on the grocer to provide you your basic sustaining life energy. See? Uh, you may have a narrow diet when the time of trouble comes. <laughs> you, you know, you, you may have to narrow things down a bit. But if you're growing your own, your own uh, potatoes and your own corn and your own other veggies, you know, you, you will survive. God will provide so that you will survive. You're working with God when you follow His counsel. Isn't that right? Yes. So that's what we want to do is follow God's counsel. Anyway, um, now look at verse 6. In chapter 11, it says, The Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And again, he might as well have said, One family. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. This rebellion. This resistance to God's will. And they begin to do it. And then he goes on to say, Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that restrains the wicked. And so when your mind is so closed and you can't hold, hear the Holy Spirit anymore, nothing will be restrained from you. So God has to then intervene. And often God intervenes in ways that are very um, damaging to those who are in rebellion. So God said in verse 7, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And God confounded the languages, as you know. Now look at verse 8. This is very interesting. And I have a question for you. How do we know that Paul, in Acts chapter 17, is talking about the Tower of Babel? Remember what Paul said? God hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth. All right, watch this. Verse 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. Oh, Paul is quoting Moses. <laughs> Paul is quoting Moses, almost word for word. It's just the difference between New Testament and Old Testament. He's quoting him word for word. In other words, Paul is definitely talking about the Tower of Babel when God made all the nations of one blood. All right? So now it says, The Lord scattered them from thence upon all the face of the earth, and they left off to build the building. So God stopped their project. So that was the first purpose of God in uh, confounding the languages was to stop the Tower of Babel, to stop the rebellion, and then scatter everybody. The very thing that they had refused to do voluntarily, God organized sort of involuntarily. You know, They couldn't, re couldn't understand each other anymore, so they had to gather in little groups and go off in the same language groups you know, and go off here, there, and everywhere. And eventually they scattered themselves abroad from thence upon all the face of the earth. Okay? Now, that was the beginning of changes that began to take place. Changes in their racial complexion. Their racial personality. Their cultural action and, 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 and activity and mentality. Their cultural mentality. That's when the changes began to take place in the way they do business, trade, commerce, the way they think, the way they, they raise their families, the way they do their thing. Um, and it's very interesting. There's a study, a scientific study. I'm not a scientist, but I've been paying attention to this because I'm involved in the health work. We have two health retreats, two lifestyle New Start type centers in Australia. And those, uh, those people that come to us um, have lifestyle problems. And so this is a field of study that affects lifestyle, so I pay attention to it a little bit. Um, it's called epigenetics. Have you ever heard of epigenetics? Huh? Epigenetics is a very interesting study that's unfolding. It's, right now, they're sort of at the tip of the iceberg. You know, they, 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 they have some basic outlines, but there's a whole lot more underneath that they're just starting to research. And it will eventually, of course more and more will come to light. But anyway, epigenetics is very interesting, and I was, my wife actually shared with me some things on, um, on climate, 
and how that affects the epigenetics. And the fact is that people who live in cold climates have a whole different outlook and way of doing things than people who live in warm climates. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Um, the Germans, for instance, I'm German. My name is Mayer or Maya. Das ist Deutsch. <laughs> Mayer, this is, this is German. So the Germans, for instance, my cultural heritage, or most of my cultural heritage, comes from Germany. Now after the flood, what happened, or during the flood, what happened to the Earth axis? It tilted. And that kept it from being equal climate all over north to south. And now we have cold in the south, uh, way in the south and way in the north. And we have this warm band of equatorial region around the middle of the earth, right? And it spins and, you know, the seasons and the days and nights and everything still go on. But w the flood itself dramatically changed the relationship between the sun and the earth and between the moon and the earth and the moon and the sun, for that matter. It also changed the earth so that now we have extreme cold and extreme heat. All right? Now, people who live in cold climates have to plan and strategize and organize so that they have food all year long. Before the age of airplanes, when you could bring food from other places uh, into a supermarket in your local you know, community, People had to organize themselves, and they had to plan. If you didn't put your potatoes in the cold storage, or you didn't bottle your apples, or you didn't somehow freeze or preserve your other fruits, you would run out of food, and you wouldn't have anything to eat. So the Germans learned to plan, and they strategized, and they organized. And now, even today, it, it affects every other area of German life. The trains run on time. If you are half a minute late, you've missed the train. Sorry about that, folks. But you go to India, a warm climate, trains are notoriously late. It's because if they can't do it today, well, all right, we'll do it tomorrow. You know, Latin America is that way, too, you know, and a lot of it anyway, in, in the warmer areas of Latin America. Manana. You know, if it's not going to be done today, we'll do it tomorrow. And if it's not done tomorrow, we'll do it next week. And if it's not next week, we'll do it next month or next year. You know, that's just the way they are. So, it also affected the attitude of people. You know, the Germans, if you walk into a German home and you expect to be fed and housed without an invitation, you've just offended them. Right? You've just offended them. You don't go into a German home without an invitation. <laughs> All right, but in a Latin home, what happens? If you're a total stranger, it doesn't matter. You can walk into their home. The, oh, come on in. You're a long-lost friend, family member. Come on, have something to eat. Sleep in the bed. And, you know, and they'll make you part of the family. No problem. They love that sort of thing, and they're very warm and friendly, whereas the Germans tend to be more cold and... You know, hopefully I'm becoming more Latin all the time. <laughs> but anyway, bottom line is, there's a difference in racial attitude and racial thinking the, based on climate. And when God sent people here and there and everywhere, He created these races. I don't, do you think God abandoned them when, when He scattered them? No! God intended to do something else by scattering them. Not just stop the rebellion at the Tower of Babel. That's one important thing. But I want you to notice, the Bible says in verse, come back to Acts, pardon me, come back to Acts chapter 17. I'm going to show you something very interesting. Notice the next verse, verse 27. Why did God do this? Why did God scatter them? He scattered them so that, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find it. If by chance, if by happenstance, if by some kind of miracle, they will turn their hearts back to the Lord and they will find him, for he is not very far from every one of us. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful verse? That's why God really did this. He wanted to save souls. Shouldn't we be focused on soul saving? Amen. Shouldn't that be our main emphasis? 
soul saving. We should put our money into soul saving. We should be putting our energies into soul saving. We should be putting our time and our influence into soul saving. After all, that's what heaven is all about, saving souls. So God confounded their languages. He attacked the Tower of Babel and scattered the people abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth so that they could find him if possible. And then he went with them and worked with them to develop their agricultural methods. He went to develop, help them develop their social structures. He helped them develop their methods of business, trade and commerce, their governments, their ways of doing things. God, God went with them and developed their cultural identity. He helped them to develop their, their cultural personality. You know, the, the Latins are quite different from the... I keep using the Latins and the Germans, but there's many other comparisons that could be made as well, you know, because there's so many different races. There's thousands of races. Well, actually, there's only four basic races, all right? Four basic races. But there are many... There's almost seemingly endless numbers of sub-races, you know what I mean? There's Asians, for instance. That's, that's one of the races, the Asian. And the, so there's the Filipinos, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese, the Indonesians, the, you know, Bur huh? Burmese, yes. I mean, you know, the list is pretty long, right? Uh, among the Latinos, that's another race. There are many, uh, quite a few different uh, 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 varieties or sub-races of the Latino um, and then, of course, there's the uh, Europeans, which is a, another race. And there's many sub-varieties of that. And um, so in each race, there's many different levels of, uh, of, of uh, or I should say, different uh, types of, um, of racial expression that we get. And genetic expression is a result of, of this epigenetic principle. So... In other words, God went with them, established their races, and now we have them today. But in the meantime, the enemy's gotten in the works, and as we say in Australia, through a spanner in the works. <laughs> the enemy, you know who that is. <laughs> he likes to take advantage of the carnal heart. And if people are carnal, they do things that aren't nice. And they also do things that are sinful. So one race or another, you know, some races, rose up and began to control and then oppress other races. And that creates animosity on a racial basis. And so there's, there is this foundation in there, in the carnal heart, that makes some races try to, you know, uh, dominate. That's the right word. Thank you other races. And so we have the sad history of slavery and the sad history of the impact that that has made on families and homes and we're still dealing with it today. Now, isn't that interesting? That's how the races came about. If we're going to understand racism, we ought to understand how the races came about. But the Bible tells us that God... Um, God has a way to deal with racism. Um, if you'll come with me to uh, Revelation chapter 13, I just want to show you one other verse that talks about how the enemy is going to use racism at the end of time. just want to point this out because we're, it's laying a foundation for something I'm going to say a little bit later. Verse 7 says... Revelation 13, verse 7, And it was given unto him. This is the first beast. It's talking about the papacy. All right? It says, It was given unto him to make war with the saints. Are you the saints today? <laughs> I hope so. By God's grace. Thank you. That's the right word. It was given unto him to make war with the saints. So the enemy is going to make war on you. And he's going to use every means and every tactic, every deceit, every confusion, everything he can to organize you so that you will be lost. Do you realize that you're up against an enemy that's determined that you're going to lose your salvation? 
but you're also up against a friend. I shouldn't say up against a friend. You have a friend who is going to do everything that he possibly can to bring you to salvation. That's Jesus Christ and all, all the agencies of heaven. Isn't that wonderful? So it's really not about me. It's about the controversy between Christ and Satan. It's really about how we are going to respond. Are we going to respond to the enemy or are we going to respond to the Lord? Which is it going to be? And some of us want to continue sort of being both. <laughs> that's a problem. In the end times especially, that's a problem. Because we want to, if we want to be both, we're not going to be for Christ. It's that simple. So it was given unto him to make war with the saints. And to do what? Overcome, Overcome them. That doesn't mean that, they can, that he can force you to sin. What that means is he can overcome any protection that you might have. All right? That God allows him to overcome. God's angels and Christ will stand by your side. We know that from Scripture. That in the time of trouble, you will be protected to, the, to, uh, to only suffer that which God has permitted you to go through. Amen? Amen. All right. But that th this word overcome means that he will have control over you. Some of you will be in prison. Some of you might be martyred. Some of you might have other painful experiences as a result. But how does he go about this? The enemy will use many things. And it says here, and power was given him over all kindreds. What is kindred in the Bible? Relatives, family, okay? Your kin, we say, you're, this is, this is, my kin is here, my kin is there. And, and th this is kindred, this is family. So he will use your family if he can so that you will lose your salvation. Do, have you ever had pressure from your family to do something that isn't right? <laughs> well, there you go. All right, now, what about the next one? It says, and tongues. So in other words, your language. He might even use your language to get you out of salvation into the enemy's camp. Right? All right. Then look at the next one. And what? Nations. Nations. That's race. The enemy is going to use your race against you. And you will be facing some serious challenges based on your race. And I'm not just talking about one race. I'm talking about all races. You see, Satan will use everything he can. All right, so now that lays a foundation. Now let's come back to Acts chapter 17 again, our scripture text for today. Verse 26 says that God hath made of one blood all nations of men. In other words, out of one family, God raised up all other nations of men. He raised up the the four basic races, and then divided them up even more so that they would not try, or make, let me put it this way, so that they would not be able to establish globalization very easily in the future. That's another reason why God made the races and confounded the languages. So that globalization would not be very easy again. You see, language is actually very important to globalization. And the new globalists today have already established the language of globalization. Do you know what it is? English. English, that's right. If you don't speak English as your first language, well, you're going to have to learn it. <laughs> At least enough to get along. In other words, God has made the languages that helps to slow down the process of globalization. It's amazing that the globalists have gotten as far as they have today. You know, banking and commerce and trade and trade agreements and all that. Mr. Trump is kind of trying to tear them down a little bit, you know, and trying to, you know, set that back a little bit. You know, the angels have their hands on the winds of strife, don't they? And if they don't slow things down, so, you know, it may well be that God brought Trump in to, uh, to power at such a time as this to slow down globalization. 
In other words, so they can't resurrect the Tower of Babel. I mean, Mr. Trump has his own problems. I'm not trying to, and I'm not making political statements here. I'm just, I'm looking at this from a prophetic point of view. By the way, it is not about politics. There's a lot of intersection between, um, between prophecy and politics. It's not about the politics, my friends. It's about prophecy. And a lot of times people get confused about that. They'll read my website, and I put up a lot of briefings, prophetic intelligence briefings, on a daily basis and sometimes they'll 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 you know I'll I will put up a briefing from a source that's a conservative source and the leftists will slap my wrist and they'll say, ah, bah, 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 you know and then I'll write something from a uh, liberal side <laughs> from a source a, a news source that's liberal such as the New York Times or or Los Angeles Post, or USA Today, or whatever, and I will then get slapped by the conservatives. Oh, you're siding with the liberals. You know, you can't win if you're talking about politics, especially online. And I'm constantly having to remind people that this is not about politics. This is about the intersection with politics and prophecy. Because we are students of prophecy, and if we're going to be watching the unfolding events about the end of time, we have got to understand that it's not about politics that we're concerned about. We only address politics as they relate to Bible prophecy. Amen? So when you read my website, make sure you understand that when you, you, know, when you see something that you don't particularly agree with. The, tr the trouble is most people, most people listen to the news sources that agree with them. You know, so if, if they're of a, a more leftist bent, they'll l read the leftist thing. And if they're more rightist bent, uh, they'll read the right uh, side of the news. And in fact, this has been most pronounced during this election that we just had that put Mr. Trump in the president. The thing was, the leftist media wasn't paying attention to what the right conservatives were doing, see. And they had completely written off the mainstream media. Mr. Trump did a very effective job of disconnecting them from the, the news media, and they even complain about it today. They say, oh, he's made a, people distrust the media. Well, <laughs> <laughs> CNN got called up on, at least on two occasions that I know of where they had to, you know, uh, retract the story because it was fake news. You know, so... They deserve it, I suppose, but the bottom line is that's not what we're about. We're about prophecy. And whenever something pops up on prophecy, it could come up on either side. And when Mr. Obama was president, the leftists were you know, really strong. There was a lot of prophetic fulfillments under Mr. Obama. You know, and people would criticize me because I was supposedly criticizing Mr. Obama. I'm not criticizing Mr. Obama or Mr. Trump for that matter. It's about prophecy. And any president, no matter if he's left or right, or whether he's centrist or whatever, he's going to do things that fulfill Bible prophecy. Amen? Amen. That's the way the nature of politics is. That's the nature of Bible prophecy. That's the, na the, the amazing thing is that the Bible tells us what to expect. Yes. So the Bible tells us that we're to expect a leftward shift that goes all the way as, to, almost to socialism, and, and it's going to upset the conservatives, and then it's going to swing all the way back to the right. We are now in the rightward swing in reaction to leftism over the last year, last four, eight years. And if we understand that, that will make a huge difference to what we gain from the study of the Bible in, in terms of Bible prophecy. Anyway, we'll talk about that more this afternoon. Or, sorry, at the 11 o'clock hour. The Bible says that he hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed. In other words, God went with them and he organized them. He strategized them. He organized their races and their, their, uh, uh, their, their racial personalities and their business and trade and commerce and all of that. Now it says, look at the last bit. And God appointed the bounds of their habitation. You see that? What's the habitation? Habitation is where you live, isn't it? So it was God who set the bounds of their habitation. That's what it says, right? God was the one who separated the races. 
Ooh. <laughs> now that is about as politically incorrect as you'll ever hear from me. <laughs> Do you like politically incorrect sermons? <laughs> this is a politically incorrect sermon. <laughs> it was God who separated the races. And he set the bounds of their habitation. Now, are these bounds of their habitation, are they like boundaries that are hard boundaries where, for instance, you might have to have a passport to cross over from one country to the next? No. These are not boundaries that are hard boundaries. They're soft boundaries. So around the periphery, there is a lot of engagement between the races, such as intermarriage, such as... Um, uh, business, trade, and commerce. There's translational things going on. All sorts of things to interact around the edges of these races. Because God knows that the world still has to go round. <laughs> you know. You still have to have a practical way of conducting life in a world that has many different races. Right? And God is not rigid in that kind of thing. He's... he's he understands what's going to work and what's not, and he organized it just so that it will work. Anyway, so you have all this, this, the boundaries of their habitation. The point I'm trying to make is that we as, uh, in our race, we gravitate to people of the same race. I'll give an example of this. One time I was preaching in a tiny little church over in South Australia. And it was Sabbath school hour, much like it is right now. And over here on my left was a Filipino couple sitting there next to the wall with some seats next to them. And I was preaching along, and there were other people in the audience, and all of a sudden, a Filipino friend of mine, a colleague actually, came walking in the back door. And I thought to myself, I'll bet you she's going to go sit with those people over there. So I kind of kept my eye on her as I continued the sermon. And sure enough, she looked around the audience and spotted those people over there. She looked again, and then she said, oh, I'm going to go sit down with them. And she sat right there next to them. I thought, oh, boy, <laughs> didn't I make the right prediction? <laughs> why, did I, why could I make that prediction? I, said, I just know. You know, if you're in a minority environment, where you are in a minority, your race is in a minority, you especially like to gravitate to people of your same race because you want to find out who they are, what's their background, how do they live, and maybe they have similar experiences, similar mentality. You know, especially the mentality really bonds people together too, doesn't it? And so they would sit together or they would gravitate together. That's why we have Korean churches. That's why we have black churches. That's why we have have uh, Japanese churches. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on and on. There's all these different race, racially or ethnically organized churches out there. And yes, there are some that come in from other... And even in other countries, we have um, American churches or English churches. You know, things like in Okinawa. I went to Okinawa not long ago, and they took me to see the English church in Okinawa. Well, that was so we could go to the, see the memorial of the of the Hacksaw Ridge and all of that. But anyway, um, you, you see, there's, we have this racial tendency to gravitate one toward another of the same race. When I'm in Australia and I meet another American, I want to find out who they are and what they've done. I gravitate to them. You see? It works. Anyway, so she sat down with them. And they sat there and they listened to the whole sermon. Then they listened to the church service. They're still sitting together. They didn't make enemies during the church, Sabbath school, so they sat together during church. <laughs> and then during the fellowship dinner, this tiny little church had a little one-room, uh, maybe two-room fellowship hall in the back. And it was so small, there was just one long table. And we were all sitting around this table. I was kind of in the middle and talking to people all around me. And then over here on my left, once again, were these three Filipinos. All the way down there at the end of the table, sitting there, talking among themselves the whole time. So about, I don't know, I suppose two-thirds of the way through the meal, I finally turned to my friend and I said, Lolita? She said, what, Pastor Mayor? <laughs> 
I said, I have a Bible text for you. She said, really? What is it? I said, it's Acts chapter 17, verse 26. <laughs> she says, what does it say? I said, well, look it up. So she got out her device, you know. <laughs> you know how they do. <laughs> oh, she said, what does that mean? <laughs> I said, Lolita, you are the classic example of the fulfillment of this Bible verse. Oh, she says, what do you mean? I said, well, ever since you came in, you've been with your Filipino friends. You have gravitated to them, and you aren't really connecting with the rest of us. Oh, she said, I'm so sorry. And she started apologizing. I said, don't apologize. It's quite all right. I'm not offended by it at all. I said, I'm just pointing it out. I'm making my point. And in fact, as other people were right around listening, they could see it very clearly, you know, that we gravitate to those of our own race. We have Spanish-speaking churches too, by the way. In fact, I think your old church in central... Central Phoenix is now a Spanish church, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. We like to, uh, uh, um, we like to fellowship in, in familiar patterns, familiar ways. So, in other words, God has made the bounds of their habitation. The bounds of the habitation is talking about the culture that we experience as people, individuals in our own race. So we are naturally attracted to our own race. And it's very difficult to break out from that. You have to make deliberate efforts or have to be raised in a certain environment where you break out from that. I have a friend who is uh, Polynesian, uh, but she was raised in, a, um, um, in an Australian home. And uh, so she had mostly Australian friends and family. Um, but she herself, racially speaking and genetically speaking, is Polynesian. And so for her, she doesn't have the, 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 the strong uh, draw to Polynesian culture that, that she would have otherwise had. She mixes well with all. So there are some exceptions to this principle. It's, it's never a rigid thing. God's not rigid in the way he does this. But the bottom line is that we are culturally bound together to our own race. God did that. Globalism didn't do that. Globalism wants to mix everybody together. Go globalism wants to erase racial distinction. And it's all, it all sounds very good, you know. But is it going to happen? No, it's not. Is there going to be a resolution of racism? No, it's not. It's only going to get worse. The enemy wants to continually stir it up in some way or another. So... How are God's people, and we're going to close with this in the next five minutes. How, is, how does God propose to deal with the racism issue in his people? To scatter them? Yeah, win souls everywhere in the world. That's right. Okay, but there's another, there's another important aspect of this. Come over to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation Chapter 14, I want to show you this. It's very interesting. This may be some, uh, you, this is a very familiar verse, but you may have never thought of it this way before. I'm going to show you something that I think will be astonishing. At least it was to me when I saw it myself. Revelation 14, verse 6. Okay, Revelation 14, verse 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. Now, this is the only place in Scripture where the, the gospel is described as everlasting. Did you know that? And this is the first angel of the three angels' messages, isn't it? So, in other words, the gospel that is to be preached is the same gospel that was there long before time began. And it will be with us throughout all the ceaseless ages of eternity, my friends. Amen. We'll be studying and analyzing and appreciating the gospel throughout all eternity. I mean, after all, this world's experience will have made such an impact on us that we will never want to stop thanking Christ for what he did for us. 
out in all eternity. Can you imagine? Oh, praise God. Now notice, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on, and they might as well have said, the face of all the earth. Right? Dwell on the earth. He just doesn't use all the same words, but he basically has the same idea. All right, so this message is to be preached to everyone who dwells on all the face of the earth. Just like, in other words, Nimrod was trying to get everybody under one government control of the whole world in rebellion to God. God is going to try and bring people back to loyalty to Him, especially in worship, because Revelation 13 is all about worship, isn't it? So He's going to try and bring people to align with God in true worship. That's his purpose. And the gospel is how he, through the Holy Spirit, reaches the hearts of people in this wicked world. So the gospel is to be preached to them that dwell on, on the earth and to every what? Race. Every nation. That's talking about race. Now let me ask you a question. If you have racism in your heart against another race, how can you go to them and win them to the kingdom? You can't do it, can you? You really can't do it. If you don't, if you have, if you have some animosity to someone because of their race, you will not be able to go and try and, with the burden for their soul, earnestly work for their salvation. That's why many of us are, well, perhaps that's why many of us are a little lazy when it comes to soul winning. Because we, we may have some feelings. And by the way, if you have racism coming at you, don't rise up and go back at it in the other direction. Because that's just going to cause you to sin against those who you should be winning to the soul, to, uh, their souls to the Lord. Right? It goes both ways. Now, look at uh, the rest of this. To every race and to every kindred, which is families, and every tongue. Notice that Revelation 13, verse 7, and Revelation 14, verse 6 have the same entities listed. You see that? So, in other words, the, th the three angels' messages is God's way of overcoming racism. Hello? We are the church of the three angels' messages, are we not? And the three angels' messages God has specifically designed to address the issue of racism in individual hearts. Right? So in other words, God has a plan to use the last message to unite people together in love and overcome their proclivities to racism. All of us have a proclivity to racism one way or the other. Now look at the rest. It says to every kindred and tongue and what? It's as if Paul, John, the Apostle John, throws in an extra word here. People. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it's not, it, not meaning races or nations because it's already mentioned. It's not meaning families because that's already mentioned. It's not meaning uh, language groups because that's already mentioned. What does people mean? It means individuals. Did you know you're a people? <laughs> yeah, John is telling us that the everlasting gospel is a personal gospel. It's an individual gospel, and it will be given to each person individually. The Holy Spirit will appeal to each person individually through the three angels' messages. Not just, you're not going to be saved through your race. You're not going to be saved through your family. You're not going to be saved by your language group or any other factor other than your relationship, your personal, individual relationship to Jesus Christ. That's really what it's saying. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, individuals. Oh, boy, breaking down the first angel's message like that is a little unusual, isn't it? In fact, one time I had somebody come. I was preaching in a black church in Atlanta. 
And after I was finished, I was out shaking hands with people and finished shaking hands and turned around. Here was this gentleman standing there to me. He says, Pastor May says, you were bold. I said, well, the Bible's bold. <laughs> the Bible tells it like it is. How can I do anything otherwise? But we're not getting this kind of message in our churches. I said, well, they're not preaching the Bible then, are they? No, they're not, he said. <laughs> I said, well, brother, take this message back to them. Help them see it. Because if we continue to foster racism on either side of the equation, we're going to end up in trouble with the Lord. No matter who you are or where you're from. And I'm glad to see, by the way, that this church is a rather multicultural church, Pastor. It is wonderful. That's the way it ought to be, really. I don't like this idea of having Korean churches and Spanish churches and black churches and this church and that church. You know, I, I prefer that we all sort of get together. And, and I realize that there are language barriers and sometimes it's, it's, it's you know, difficult and, and, and important to have those kind of arrangements. But when there's no language barrier, why bother? The three angels' message just gives us the power that we need. And yes, there is even racism in the Adventist church. Sorry to say. But that's true of the Anglicans. It's true of the Baptists. It's true of the uh, Pentecostals. It's, you know, so th the fact is that in the church you have carnal people as well as, as spiritual people. That's right. So... Um, the enemy continues to play on our carnal propensities, even if we're already a baptized member. You know, so we have to understand that. But at the same time, we have to preach the truth. So that helps people to understand how they're to react, how they're to live, and how to, they're to abide in this world as God's servants, right? So um, racism is something that the Bible alone can deal with. Not, it's not going to happen by racism, uh, sorry, by globalization. Globalization will not solve the problem of racism, nor will political things, political policies, you know, or political uh, agendas. That's not going to solve the problem. Nor will marches and defacing monuments and other kinds of statements of protest. That's not going to solve the problem. It's only going to make it worse. The sooner we learn that, and the sooner we learn that Jesus himself never tried to establish a political reform and that we are to follow his example, the sooner we learn that, the better off we're going to be. Desire of Ages tells us that Jesus lived in a very corrupt and oppressive environment. The government under which Jesus lived was really bad. And it gives some description of that. And then it says, Jesus did not try to establish a new government he did not try to establish new laws and he did not try to uh, change the way or interfere with the governing powers that's the word the, bio, the spirit prophecy uses to interfere he knew he goes on the spirit prophecy goes on the desire of ages goes on to say that he knew that the only way to change the circumstances uh, whatever the word is that she uses was to change the heart one by one. So Jesus ministered to souls, individuals, to peoples. Right? And that's how we are to live in these last days. We are to minister to souls without regard to race, without regard to uh, culture, without regard to background, upbringing, wherever and however God leads us to people, we are to help, help them find their way to the kingdom of heaven. Amen? So, may God bless you, my brothers and sisters, as you think about how, you know, you, you probably heard about Charlottesville, right? Anybody here heard about Charlottesville, Virginia? You have? Yes, a few of you. Charlottesville was a very sad case, but it was a classic demonstration of the problem of carnality in dealing with racism. You have the white supremacists there that were trying and fighting with the Antifa, you know, fascists, uh, the anti-fascists, but they're really fascists. But anyway, <laughs> it's a bit confusing. But anyway, they're fighting and some guy drove his car into the crowd and killed this one woman and injured 19 others. Remember that? I live 35 minutes from Charlottesville. I live in Virginia. And racism is very strong in Virginia. So 
Uh, it's very important for us to understand that the Bible is clear of how we are to act. We cannot engage in those things. We have to rise above it. We cannot let our feelings become stirred up and angry when something happens against us or our race. Because if we do, we end up you know, offending God. God wants us to live above all that and give the message, my friends, the message of truth and righteousness of the three angels' messages. So may God bless you, my brothers and sisters, and may you live for Him no matter what, is my prayer.